story, fuckers. Welcome to another bleeding deadly episode of Linux Lads. My name is Mike, and with me in the virtual studio today is Shane. Hello, folks. Connor. Hello, hello, hello. And also Mark from the Binary Time Podcast. Welcome, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much. How's it going, guys? Yeah, it's all good. So, we should proceed to a new first item on the list, which is our our Azire VPN coupon code. Uh, Azire VPN has provided for our listeners a, f- uh, a discount coupon. So if you buy three months of their service, uh, you will pay. F- you will get thirty percent off the price. Uh, it works out somewhere about uh, between eight and nine quid. Uh, for that, uh, they are a really good company. They obviously support Linux. They support OpenVPN and WireGuard. Uh, they have servers in uh, Europe and North America. They install them and service them themselves because they don't trust anybody else to do it. They are based in Sweden, so they don't have to take logs of your of your traffic through there. And their uh, client is GPL2 license, so they do hard Linux. Uh, when you do decide to when you do uh, uh, go go and apply the linux slats uh, linux slats uh, coupon word make sure you click the green add code button to get the discount otherwise it, otherwise it won't go through the details are going to be in our show notes anyway so guys what have you been up to since the last we spoke um so I guess, yeah, I guess I'll go first. <laughs> um, I've made uh, the switch from uh, Linux Mint Cinnamon to KDE Neon recently. And I've never, ever been a K- KDE kind of guy. Like I've always rejected it over the years because I just didn't like the way it looked. But um, it's it's a lot different nowadays. Like it's definitely got some tricks under its sleeve. Um, it's totally uh, quite a different idea like quite a different approach to uh, to a desktop environment that I've been used to, uh, which I find interesting, because it's um, it's a lot more pain based, and there you know there's a lot more functionality kind of packed into everything. I find um, it's not quite as sparse as other DEs. Um, like everywhere you look, there's some option for something. Like and uh, but it's it's interesting. Like it's it's the customizability of it or the customization. What would you say? Really, I don't know. Um, that's kind of put very front and center in in the desktop environment which i really like um so it's like i, I was going mad for like an hour theming it and changing things and, and uh, adjusting the panels and everything i know you can do that in most desktop environments if you want to but like i don't know with kd it just felt a little bit easier a little bit more accessible uh well what i've been up to is i have finally banished my windows partition yeah so, ah. <laughs> round of applause, round of applause. Welcome um, to the Linux only club. <laughs> yeah, you're no. the Linux desktop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, the, uh, I had been um, obviously Linux exclusive for about two years, but what it was was the audio interface that I was plugging my microphone into was very intermittent. I mean, um, the last recording I did uh, of, the, of the last episode, I did using that audio interface in Linux and it worked. And then the very next day, Pushed up my computer it was it didn't light up or anything so it's kind of intermittent um when i'm on was on windows it you're able to download a driver off its off the the uh it was the focus right solo uh audio interface so off the focus right website there was a windows driver and of course that worked reliably so in order to, for it to work reliably i had a windows partition unfortunately uh so what i did was uh went out and bought this burn Behringer um audio interface and it was actually much cheaper i mean i think the focus right is freaking about 100 euro and this Behringer, including shipping i think cost me about 35 or 40 euro um wow. and this seems to be working perfectly fine so at the moment it's linux mint exclusive on this uh computer there's no other partitions so yay i'm back in the warm embrace of linux woohoo <laughs> Well, I suppose for the the last hour, I'd say I've been trying to get my focus right and everything else working on um, on a PC that um, I wouldn't normally use for for audio uh, recording. So, because um, uh, to chat to all of you, uh, I have um, Discord on on my Linux Mint install here, 
Um, but I wouldn't normally record. I'd just use this for a bit of gaming or whatever. And um, so what I ended up doing was um, to get Audacity to work with my Focusrite, uh, I installed PAVU control and uh, just turned all my other audio interfaces off and uh, just left my Focusrite on and uh, eventually changed it to stereo duplex <laughs> as well so that I could uh, hear everyone and everyone could hear me. And um, yeah, it's it's working great. I eventually managed to, to have a chat with you all, so happy days. And my audacity is still recording too. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. Long and uh, and <laughs> as you're describing that and you're saying you have uh, keep mentioning focus right, it's like, wait, uh, maybe if I didn't even know about that, maybe maybe oh, you could have saved me 35 or 40 euro. But anyway, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll it figures, we'll figure something out eventually. But uh, at the moment, this Berger uh, interface seems to be working for me. Nice one. Nice one. Yeah, it's uh, it's Linux audio is uh, is a way it's it's a journey. It's an exploration of uh, <laughs> technical and personal uh, limits and abilities. I I hit that limit in myself uh, very soon after starting recording this podcast, and I'm just relying on everybody else to give me advice on what to do. As I'll for tell me, you one thing. Sorry, Mike, but one thing you could do, I was saying it to Shane earlier, like I'm using uh, AV Linux now for all my podcasting and everything. Now, I don't have Discord installed on that, but uh, it is a sweet distro for doing any audio production. Yeah, you Everything see this just works. Thing, thing is, my, my house is, well, my flat is basically just overflowing with computers, but the only <laughs> one that I can use for uh, for recording that is... Uh, that would be like low low noise fan, uh, low fan noise, and uh, uh, like enough power to run Discord. Uh, that and actually the, even the ability to run Discord because the Raspberry Pis and the and the Pinebook, there's no app for it for ARM for Discord. So the only one that I can use for this is my wife's computer. And uh, honey, I'm gonna replace your Ubuntu Mate with. Uh, uh, with AV Linux, and you're just <laughs> gonna have to get all your documents uh, backed up and put back. Uh, that sentence just doesn't bite well. It doesn't doesn't doesn't. It's not going to uh, go well with her. So, I think anyway. So I'm just gonna have to have to either get myself something that can run AV Linux or uh, or stick with stick with this. Uh, as for me, what I was doing uh, over the last two weeks, I was mostly trying to get something done in Python for work, and I, I always loved Python on about. Oh, I still love Python about because it empowers people like me who are not exactly uh, trained developers to do a lot of stuff. But then I discovered one thing that when, when. Uh, when you don't know what exactly it is doing in the background, you can run into bugs or you can create bugs that are very difficult to find because like in C or in Rust, the memory management is up to you to figure out and it gives you control and knowledge of what it does. In Python, everything's abstracted away and suddenly I created a bug that uh, that just had my head spinning and I, it took me an, an actual developer an hour to figure it out. So. This is uh, this is my experience that Python yeah is very empowering and powerful and lovely, but people have to be careful with it. Okay, uh, without further ado, let's proceed to the news. Uh, there is a new official wallpaper uh, for the 1904 Disco Dingo. Uh, this is from ONG Ubuntu. They have a picture. Link is going to be in the show notes, and it is in the vein of Cosmic Cuttlefish and uh, the. Uh, bionic beaver wallpaper and to me it looks lovely guys what are your what are your uh, opinions uh, that certainly does look nice there's a nice um, it's a nice gradient to it um it's mm. purple as as want to do with the ubuntu team but um it's it's certainly um certainly a nice kind of gradient to the background um and it's an interesting logo that they've come up with it's kind of a, a wireframe um, version of a dingo with a um, mm. pair of headphones to add the disco element to it so uh, that dingo is going it's, 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 it's in the background um but yeah looks pretty good 
Yeah, I have to say I really like it. Like the the I think the design aspect of Linux is is really is something that's improved lately. It's uh hmm. like you see a lot of projects emphasizing um emphasizing looks um which is which is good to see because like that's how you get this stuff into the mainstream like people like things that look nice. Um that's why like Apple devices are so popular like um like people want some design aspect to their technology. Um, I think it's a really cool background. Like it's very, like it's very designy. It's very kind of like, it's it's quite quite got a mainstream kind of feel to it. Um, especially with the you know the headphones on the dingo, hoo hoo, how silly. And uh, but it's uh, yeah, it's 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 really beautiful. Like um, uh, Mozilla, we spoke about that a few months back, I think, on the podcast. Mozilla doing their new design refresh and everything. Like so, I love that this stuff is being uh, is being thought about as well. Because, you know, back in the, the Wild West days of, like, distro hopping when I first got into Linux, like, you couldn't really say that too many things were very beautiful to look at. Like, there there was some distros that had, had their moments, but, like, for the most part, a lot of stuff looked very fugly. Yeah, That's my favorite was, word. It was mostly... Uh, about how to how to make the cube rotate with uh, with an aquarium inside, and then how to emulate the Windows Seven or Windows Vista or Mac OS Ten look. Uh, I had to comp, back comp then. his wobbly Windows. I, Plus, yeah, obvious. I don't with forget, Ubuntu. Yeah, don't forget the um, the the window burning as you click the X button. Oh yeah, how but close was that? This, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is nostalgia. when I. <laughs> This this uh, this wallpaper is gonna stick because many people don't actually change their wallpapers on their installations. And when I look, when I stand up and look around the office that I work in, I can see quite a few, uh, quite a few of these default Ubuntu wallpapers on people's desktops when it's not covered by Windows. So the designer who did this official thing has got the responsibility that the picture that I don't know who they are. So the picture they created is gonna be on a lot of screen. They are basically creating the Linux equivalent of those smoky windows uh, because Ubuntu is so ubiquitous and because a lot of people will just leave it there. So this is, I know it's a very big opportunity for them, but also the responsibility to get it right. And uh, uh, the the actual bravery that uh, Ubuntu and Canonical have in going their own way and having their own... uh, stylistic language that's something that uh, i admire actually mm. it looks fantastic and i, I love the, the actual wallpaper but as i was saying earlier i'm using uh, sylvia ritter's um painting as, as my background for for disco dingo because it just looks class but uh, i was wondering like would you think there'd be many people using disco dingo in, in a production environment you'd imagine they kind of stick to an lts that's that's a very good point. Um, I would say yeah, a lot of people would be seeking to an LTS release. Um, I I I can't remember who it was was it um Alan Pope or um Martin Wimpress or somebody who's connected with um Canonical, um said that the vast 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 majority now that they have their metrics, um is coming from the vast majority um keep stick to an LTS release. I think he was saying it was like. 80% it was, or it was a Mark Shuttleworth, and he was saying oh, was it wasn't it? one of their conference. He was saying twenty. He exactly said twenty x, like twenty times more people when installed the LTS. I don't remember if that's desktops or servers or all together. Probably all together. Uh, is that uh, Mark the Sylvia Rito wallpaper? Is that uh, like that kind of acid trip disco dingo? A yes. Really lovely mandala. Oh, yeah, I love that. That's yeah, actually we, I amazing. Think you showed us earlier, yeah. I'm gonna, gonna put that in the show notes. That's uh that's Oh yeah, yeah. That's I love yeah. I love this kind of imagery. Isn't it amazing? We'll, we'll, we'll definitely have uh we'll have some sort of link to that in the show notes so everyone else can see. Yeah. yeah. Psytrans Disco Dingo. Uh, <laughs> uh all right. Uh next on the news oh next next on the news is uh uh gnome uh gnome three dot thirty two is uh, released i've installed it today on my uh on my archbox haven't had time to 
uh, work with it or to uh, look into it a lot, but uh, I can just confirm that it works. Uh, again, from OMG Ubuntu, the new release is going to have fractional scaling, which is important for people who use high, high DPI monitors, so they don't have to scale by by whole numbers. They can scale by 1.5 or or whatever. Control over up, up, up permissions. So if you install something from Flatpak or from repositories, you will be able to see uh, what the app does and allow it or disallow it. New icon sent and improve Advaita team and most importantly emoji are now part of the on-screen keyboard so for people like me who know that the picture means a thousand words this is great news great news everybody um, any of you guys use GNOME in any capacity at all? Um, no I'm currently on Linux Mint um, Cinnamon so uh, and on my laptop is Antricos also working Cinema so they're based off GTK, but not the the gnome show. I am actually, you know, I started this podcast. I was all in KDE, and the way I do it is like six months, maybe a year on something, and then I go back to the other side. And I am enjoying gnome on most uh, most of the desktops that I use, or most of the computers that I use, and it's uh, it's a great experience. It's just so simple. It's limiting, obviously, there are restrictions on, on what the developers think you should be able to do with it, but it uh, it definitely, if you create a workflow that works with it, it allows you to do stuff. So I'm very happy to see uh, to see the improvements uh, that are going on. Yeah, I'm back on Unity on, on my main desktop. But just from what you were saying there, it's, it really shows the huge design difference between GNOME and KDE. Like GNOME... You, you really have to follow the workflow that you're given by GNOME, uh, whereas KDE, you're given the, the opportunity to make your own, which you don't have to either. Simple by default, complex if you want it to be. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Like I've, not, I've noticed that since I switched to uh, KDE just a couple of days ago, that um, it's not quite as opinionated um, on, on what you should do. Like uh, I found that anything I tried to do, I could find the option quite easily and something I wanted to change it wasn't that difficult to find out how to change it uh, just by looking at, at the UI not even not even searching online for an answer so that's definitely a tick box for KDE in my book mm. yeah I uh, when I was using KDE Neon I as long as you are using the applications that come with it or the non-QT applications that come with Ubuntu, it works well. If you start mixing stuff uh, because it's meant as a showcase of the most uh, most uh, current KDE or QT release, then when you start doing something a bit too complicated, it can you can run into problems with it. But uh, otherwise, yeah, as you described, if you if you want. If you want a comprehensive Linux experience, uh, then KD is amazing and Neon is a great, great distribution. Uh, next up, Nginx sold for six and uh, six hundred and seventy million US greenbacks, which is about five hundred and ninety million of euros, aka real money, uh, to <laughs> uh, to F five, which is a cloud infrastructure company, I think. Uh, I didn't know much about F five at all, but um, um, from from us kind of teasing it out in our in our Telegram chat, apparently when we said, uh, we, we've never heard of this company, uh, a couple of people replied saying, no, no, they're they're legit, like and this is what they do. So I, was, I think it was uh, you, was, Mark. Yeah, I I hadn't heard of them either, and I was kind of surprised ah. that they were this big, you know player in the in the space but apparently they're into they're big in the enterprise in load balancing and all that kind of stuff but yeah they're not anyone i had come across before which i suppose surprised me but probably didn't surprise an awful lot of other people <laughs> to me most importantly because we use nginx uh, well and uh, on, on most of the stuff that we that we do for the podcast and for the uh, dublin linux community as well uh it's important that mm. they will keep it open source, that there will always be a version like the community edition or whatever it's called that uh, we'd be able to uh, to run and it's going to be free software or open source software. And uh, so far the statements uh, 
that has been issued confirmed this that they are not that they are going to advance this and they are going to have always the open source version so that's important because nginx is a great piece of software in yeah. even like hobbyists like me can basically make it do stuff and i find it much easier to work with than say apache so uh, i i just wanted to to keep on being great and getting more development and if this is allowing them to get more resources then like that's just great news and it also shows that uh open source project open source is commercially viable as even if if it's as commercially viable if not even more uh so than uh than proprietary and we are you know who would have thought 20 years ago that you do something in an open source manner and then you uh sell it to to a commercial co then, then you basically get 670 million dollars for it yeah like it i mean as a valuation it seems kind of low when you look at you know red hat being sold for 34 billion dollars or whatever but it's still an awful lot of money yeah but i've yeah you, we don't i don't know anything about stock exchange to me the, the the numbers that start flying around where people start talking about how much whatsapp is worth mm -hmm. how much uh you know, Instagram was worth to me. That just doesn't make sense. It could be, a, or it could be completely made up. So, uh, to me, as as soon as it has hits like over a hundred million, then I'm like, yeah, any number is as good, as good as any other because I just can't even conceptualize it. Hmm. I find it kind of amusing though to think that the likes of Minecraft, which sold for what two billion euros, you know, th that's valued, you know three or four times as much as Nginx, which powers, you know, the majority of the web. I think it was, what, 60% or something? Yeah. Is it? I think... I think uh, sixty percent is like Linux share of uh, of the web. I'm not sure. You might be right, actually. I don't know. Uh, but it is it is insanely popular and prevalent everywhere because uh, it just seems to be the the better option. Uh, you know, no, it was my impression, but it could be completely wrong. Um, people feel free to send in angry emails and correct me or correct me in the in the Telegram chat. But um, that the Linux was by far the dominant web server, so we're talking about over ninety percent. I was talking about sixty percent of that would be Nginx, Being and the rest would be kind of Apache. But they're pretty much all running Linux. Is my impression? I could be wrong. I think that is the way it is, isn't it? Yeah, I think yeah. It's, I think it's the vast, vast majority is running Linux, and the rest are BSDs. Uh, yeah, I could quickly look it up, but. Uh... That would be bringing facts to this conversation <laughs> that on this podcast. Uh, that would be fake news. Yeah, yeah we don't. Fake okay, opinion yeah. is much better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like uh, you know, don't give me your facts. Just leave me with my opinions. Uh, and next, next one, which is a uh, next, next news, <laughs> next item of news is that Librem Five, according to the latest post, uh, as read from Foronix, is going to have three hardware kill switches. Uh, the first one will kill cameras and microphone. The second one, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and the third one will kill cellular basement. Say that three times loud. And uh, when you push them. When you set them all together, it will put the phone into lockdown mode that kills many other sensors like, I don't know, light sensor, whatever sensors there are. Uh, so uh, they are definitely going for the security slash privacy uh, niche of the market where Android or iOS just don't have a, uh, don't have a foothold because they are... Uh, they they just uh, especially android just ship your data wherever and you don't have much control about what the hardware actually does or even in on the iphone you have neither actually so uh do you guys think that uh, the libre m5 when it's finally out has got for what is it 700 800 euros or that i'm just guessing the price i'm not sure it's around in that year in that region do you think that this makes it more uh sellable this massive emphasis emphasis on uh security yeah, I definitely do see that um, this would certainly be um, lapped up um, because of the security features, the fact that you can lock it down. Um, I, I was my impression, and I think the 
and this was maybe six months to a year ago, I think the CEO, uh, when, they're, when they um, were doing their crowdfunding, I think the CEO alluded to the fact that um, the reason why their, their crowdfunding seemed to go like clockwork, as in they seemed to reach the goals as they were going along, is I believe he had the, their sales team or whatever had enterprise customers lined up pretty much to say, okay, if you reach this level, uh, we're going to step in and we're going to order whatever 5,000 units or whatever it is because we, we can say, okay, this is legit and we have the confidence to put in this big order now and that's put give it another boost and that's the reason why there was kind of steady um, growth in their crowdfunding. Um, those people who are ordering five thousand units or whatever two thousand units for their for their enterprise, I would imagine that this is very appealing to them. I mean, you can imagine going into a server room and uh, you don't want any kind of interference, or if you want to go into a, a, if you're doing I don't know something to do with uh, radios or anything like that, uh, or if you're working any kind of engineering that does uh, broadcasting. You don't want any kind of interference, so you'd imagine you just have this phone and you'd walk into this sensitive area and say, "Yep, yeah, Bluetooth off, uh, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi off." So that reason is not broadcasting. My phone is not broadcasting anything that would cause interference, uh, anything like that, and to be guaranteed because it's a hardware kill switch. I mean, I know in uh, an iOS and Android there is a software button that you just press, but. Uh, the extra reliability of having the hardware kill switch, I imagine, would be very appealing to enterprise customers. Uh, it would also be very appealing for um, to the likes of us, the ordinary Joe, Joe Soap or whatever. Um, it's certainly something that is uh, is appealing, and at the price point that they're hinting at, which is about, uh, uh, well, I can't remember what what the one that they're hinting at, but let's just throw a figure out there let's just say six hundred dollars or whatever um at that price point i would imagine that they are targeting this being your primary device rather than a secondary device so uh the, the features um seem do seem to back that up bar i think the screen is 720p which, which mm -hmm. at that at that at that price point is fucking ludicrous I remember meeting someone who had uh, a Purism laptop before, and they they mentioned uh, they mentioned the uh, hardware kill switches, and um, I I always thought that was a little bit paranoid at first, but um, I suppose in in this day and age, like the 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 kind of attack vectors, as they say, are you know they're getting very plentiful like it seems like you can um like uh, as evidenced by like meltdown and specter and everything like we had some very fundamental vulnerabilities that sometimes software software patches can't always get around you need like uh, you need a firmware patch like you need something a little bit deeper um so so that's encouraging like because you can have this device and it just adds just it, it adds like a, a swiss bullion vault level of security to it um so you can like if you're at all worried or you're at all paranoid you have that added reassurance but um i don't even think it's paranoid these days i think anything goes really when it comes to privacy and security i don't i don't think anything's off the table and not just from the tinfoil hat paranoid uh, the government who could be um, watching what I'm doing point of view it could just be the case of listen uh, I'm, I'm just going to chillax uh, listen to an audio book for a while I don't want my phone to be um, searching for a cell signal or or mobile phone signal or a Wi-Fi signal or something like that because I'm just literally going to chillax on the couch and just lay down with headphones and listen to my audiobook or music or whatever. I don't need the additional functionality of my phone constantly going, where's Wi-Fi, where's Wi-Fi or where's my mobile phone signal, my data signal knock off that kill switch and you could be saving yourself an extra bit of battery uh, particularly let's say if you're if you're down to five percent battery and you're thinking oh the, my sole focus for this device at, at this moment is to listen to audio and if you knock off those kill switches they then it could be benefit the battery of it's just that targeted at that 
one part so that you're eking out the extra few percent of battery for that purpose that you want. And as as well as that, like uh, on, on the privacy side of things, like for instance, I've always had Android phones. Uh, I had an iPhone briefly, like a few years ago, but I've always had Android phones. And the I noticed you can actually there's a Google service you can find where it shows you all the location tracking they've done on you. Mm -hmm. So and it's really scary. Like you just see these red lines all over a map, and it actually it traced my route because I remember that particular when I looked at it the previous weekend, I had been to Galway and Limerick uh, to see friends and like I I saw the red line from Dublin to Galway down to Limerick back to Dublin and like every little place I'd visited in those pla in those cities and I was like are you having a laugh um and I'm very conscious of these settings and I will go in and I will disable unnecessary location services I will I will deny permissions if I don't think the app should have it so it, it was quite bizarre like they were still detecting my location based on the the cell mass like the the cell towers and the uh and obviously the the wi-fi uh, pings as well like they they were they were still able to track my location even with location services like locked down so that's another that's another uh, advantage to the libra yeah it always freaks me out when i say you've been to little almore street would you like to leave a review oh it's literally just never yeah, it, it, I've that's happened to me before. Is the whole thing of I'm going to such and such cafe for for coffee and lunch, whatever, with friends, and I, I've not even uh, activated my phone. Uh, well, I may have activated my phone to look at a text message or whatever, but it's mainly in my pocket because I'm there for to converse with my friends. And then on the bus home, it just says. I see you have been in such and such a cafe. Would you like to leave a review? Like, no! <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this, so this was Librem. Uh, there are other, like, Linux kind of phone-related news. So Maru OS has a new release out that will... Uh, basically, Maru OS is uh, the convergence operating system for your mobile phone. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I think, Debian-based. Yeah, based off uh, Debian. And uh, so you have Android applications. Oh, so yeah, you have Android and you plug it into it. Or Connor, you know more about it than me. Yeah, my understanding, and again, um, it's not limited understanding. of I've not actually seen this in, in operation bar some videos. Uh, but my basic understanding of this is that uh, Android is based off a Linux kernel. So what it does is, it, when it's on your phone, it's like, okay, the Android wrapper is around that, that Linux kernel. And then as soon as you uh, plug it into the computer, what uh, Murrow OS uh, does, which is obviously installed on your phone, is saying, we're taking the same Linux kernel, but what we're doing is we're putting the, a Debian kind of wrapping around it. And then when you plug it in, it's like, okay, here's a Debian desktop with XFCE, and you can um, interact with it that way. Sorry, you uh, you might have cut out there for a moment. Did you say to plug it into a computer or computer monitor? Oh, computer monitor. Sorry. Uh, yeah, as in th this is your this would be your your computing device would be the mo mobile device. Yeah, there is uh, there is obviously a limited amount of devices that this can run on so far. But with this new release, they increase the amount of devices. Uh, it includes now the Nexus Five X, which. Uh, I used to have, uh, and uh, despite its age, it's still a decent phone. So people who have one spare and it's still running, they you can you can just download the image uh, and try it. And uh, it, this can be the way this can be the real convergence for for a lot of people who like using in Android but uh, and don't want to carry a notebook or a laptop everywhere. And tangentially related, I think Librem are going to do their own version of Convergence as well. Um, they have hinted at that, but um, a lot of people are saying, why hint at it when you haven't even released a, a, the We're talking about Convergence on a mobile phone device. When you haven't actually released a mobile phone device, why announce this now? But it, I suppose it's, it's keeping the the uh the their name and the news uh, i'm not saying it's that's the only reason but it's i suppose it's a side effect of them making these announcements as well but certainly if uh, morrow os and Libram were going to do something very similar uh, the more competition the more players in in that space the better as far as i'm concerned 
Yeah, it's just uh, Mario OS uh, has got the uh, Android in it, uh, Librem won't, so I think it's kind of two different things. Uh, for people who are really concerned about privacy, uh, privacy and security, you get your Librem. For people who have who really want Android, uh, you have your Mario OS, and uh, that's choice, and as all we know, choice is great. Uh, anybody has anything else to add to this uh, news piece? Well, I, I think, like... I think Purism are going down totally the right track in that they're doing the hardware and the software, you know, so they're building a nice, nice ecosystem. Like you've got your, your laptops, your tablets, your um, 2FA keys, and you'll have a phone as well, you know, and you'll probably be able to share all your data among your devices. Uh, you'll have your kill switches. I think like, you know, there's definitely, as you were saying earlier, Connor, there's legitimate use cases for that where you're going into spaces that can't have RF, you know, just kill, kill your RF dead. And it's, you know, it's not software control. It is hardware, a uh, hardware kill switch. No better way to make sure that you are actually killing your RF, you know. So I I really hope they succeed because I think they've they've got the right kind of um, ecosystem going, you know. But I suppose we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Um, I'm, uh, lastly, on the news, or maybe one more bit. Uh, in the previous episode, we had uh, Lukáš from uh, from Pine64 on, and he mentioned that they are developing an image based on Debian uh, for the Pinebook Pro that is going to be released later this year. And uh, Lukáš has, uh, or the Pine64 company, have released some video on Vimeo that we will link in the show notes because they have got their work in, uh, they have the image working on the same board that is going to be inside the Pinebook on the Rock 64 I think it's called. And uh, so that's going on smoothly. So for, for, for people interested uh, to see what we were talking about last episode, the, the link is going to be in the show notes. Um, just a quick comment on that. It does look very smooth. Um, it seems to be a Mate desktop uh, on the base. I be- believe it's on top of Debian, but um, uh, could be could be incorrect there. But uh, I believe that is accurate. Um, and it's, it's several demos of uh WebGL playing um kind of video games um using WebGL um. Off a off a web server or whatever it was kind of basic kind of quake games and everything, but it seemed to be running at solid thirty frames per second, very smooth. Um, opening up a web browser with ten eighty p YouTube seems to be fine. The uh, uh, I think he he alluded to the fact that uh, it's it, it the um the way they've targeted it is for uh the 1080p resolution but they're saying that you can you can run and run it at higher resolutions if you want um but it's just the way they've laid things out and the icons and the scaling and everything they're at the moment they're targeting uh 1080p so i don't think they have a uh, high dpi support but uh, it could be a work in progress and that could be a goal that they want to achieve later on so okay it can play quake and everything but can it play super tux cart <laughs> I I th- if as long as there is an R sixty four, yeah, as long as there is an R sixty four image for it, then probably yeah. That's the thing. Uh, that's the thing that I find with the current Pine book that I have is that it's actually a really nifty machine. It's just for this particular architecture, there there isn't the, the software is not not everything that runs on linux is also made for arch 64 but i just uh, this is just obviously going to improve because the whole world is moving to to arm so mm. uh you know pine 64 are just on the forefront of this but this is basically where the puck is going so we should skate in this direction and we will uh, without further ado uh let's proceed to uh, let's proceed to the big discussion about user interfaces now uh we all obviously use Linux and we all use the GUI uh, and we have some preferences. Uh, there are many, Plasma, yeah. Uh, there are many different ways of doing things and Linux is the only operating system. Well, okay, there are BSDs, but we don't really talk about those. Uh, <laughs> Linux is the only operating system that gives you a good 
choice. You know, if you are on Windows, you are stuck with whatever it comes with. The same on the Mac, you are stuck with uh, Aqua or whatever. I don't know, whatever it's called. If you are on Android, there are, you know, you can configure it, but it's pretty much the same and the same for iOS. But, well, you can't configure iOS, but let me not ramble too much. Uh, so let's say, let's say, that, oh, let's uh, talk about what kind of... Uh, designs and what kind of uh, approaches to user interfaces we uh, we uh, we uh, 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 we prefer so first one is the big one textual or uh, textual or GUI for for you guys textual or non-textual uh, <laughs> yeah I mean like com sorry command line interface uh, like uh, your terminal terminal or uh, graphical user interface I would go for graphical uh, I, I like my GUI. Yeah, me too. It's uh, yeah, w but again, that's a big. It depends. Like, yeah, it depends on what you're doing. That's exactly what I was going to say as well. It's very much a. It depends. For the most part, I'm I'm GUI. Um, if I I do commands if and when it's needed, but it's the kind of thing of to install this thing, do these commands. Okay, yeah, grand, fair enough. I know how to do that, but uh, if I'm just searching for software myself for installation of of software. For example, um, uh, as an example of a GUI versus command line tool, invariably I bring up the freaking GNOME software or or the distro equivalent of that of the on on a uh, Arch. It's probably going to be uh, Pamac or something like that. Um, I I tend to use the the graphical installer for um, discovering applications. I know you can do all of that through the command line, uh, but I just tend to do it from uh, using the, the GUI. It's just what I'm used to, I suppose. Mm. I'm, I'm like split in uh, half. Obviously, it's a big, it, it depends, but I just had a thought, if somebody creates an application where, or a desktop environment, which would have, let's say, on left side, you would have your command line, and on right side, you would have your Windows, uh, and you could manipulate all the windows from the command line, and there was like some kind of nice APIs that would uh, that would connect it. So, if, say you have a spreadsheet open in LibreOffice, and you can use the command line to manipulate the data in the spreadsheet, but it will show in the spreadsheet because uh, you know, uh, like you have you have some nice command line applications like Visidata, but they don't they won't show pictures for example so you know if there was a crossover if we could if we could have both for everything uh you know like a bit like crusader which has got a little terminal at the bottom it's a file manager i mm. forgot to say so the kd dual pane kind of file manager you can manipulate the data from the command line at the bottom and it will show in the two pane windows and vice versa so a, a bit deeper interfacing of the command line with uh, with the GUI would be really something that I would appreciate. Yeah, I was, I was literally going to say that. I think you can, you could possibly do that in Dolphin as well. I don't know uh, if you can. It's not enabled by default. I think you have to kind of dig into the settings. But it's the whole thing of there will be the um, command line interface uh, as a little panel at the bottom. And let's say you're navigating through the GUI and you say, okay, I'm double clicking into this folder my pictures folder or whatever and then at the bottom it will say your slash pictures you're, you're, it will automatically update and it'll, uh, so you can and then you could if you want to you could go into that little panel at the bottom and, and type um, your commands or whatever and then it will be reflected at the top it's yeah it's it's an interesting uh, approach and it would but I the logistics of doing that for your entire operating system <laughs> I, uh, my mind kind of boggles at that no, it would be it would be probably a nightmare to develop but uh, i would uh, yeah it's it's some situations like i like to have i would like a left-handed keyboard that with, that i could write type everything with my left hand and i have the mice <laughs> mouse in my right hand and just control the computer with a combination of both uh, i don't know if anybody is as uh, strange as i am but uh, that kind of interface would probably be the best for me because, uh, yeah, I keep on having to switch and then that's that's annoying to me because I just want to do things fast. That that reminds me of the um, the guy from um, Make Love Not Warcraft, the South Park episode, where he's just kind of there with, with his 
massive massive keyboard and mouse and just (laughs) 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 I have a a good example for you though on GUI versus CLI and like there's this application that we have to use at work that has a web interface and no command line option and to create a a new user with all their their bits and bobs that they they need takes about 75 steps in the GUI (laughs) right uh, in a different application that has a command line interface, you can get the exact same effect with three commands and options. You yeah, know. no, this is this is so true. We uh, uh, like there are there are uh, when you like the difference between having an internet having a SSH access to a server and having to something like a cPanel is sometimes, uh, you know, it's sometimes uh, the difference between doing something in a second and having five minutes and doing it in five minutes. Hmm. Uh, Okay, so next point, uh, header bars uh, like GNOME, for example, combine menus and title bars. What are you guys uh, thinking about those? What do you guys think about those? Well, I I like the uh, I like the gnome approach, and I've always liked the gnome approach for for this, uh, where it has three distinct menus. You, like you have your application, system, and places. So I've always actually quite liked that um, because it keeps everything nice and separate. Just to clarify, that's the old classic gnome approach. The new gnome approach is very very different. It's uh, basically it gives you yeah it gives you one launcher, and it's it's a you don't have this anymore, but uh, basically, this this these header bars oh, yeah. they have got, they have got uh, the tit- the title of the application. Oh and- wait, a s- oh yeah, I thought you were talking about panels. Ah uh, no no no, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the next point. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I, that's not something I really look at. Um, the only thing I I I I don't like is the way Ubuntu used to do it, where they had it on the left hand side. Does anyone remember that, or am I imagining that? Um, by is define what you mean by what what was. It oh yeah, sorry the the like the You're minimize and, and buttons. Oh and yeah, close, oh, close oh, buttons yeah, yeah. And that the, the, were on the, the left hand side. That always annoyed the piss out of me. The the Mac approach, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I it really annoyed me as well. Um, some people are used to it, and um, I know I think it's uh, oh is his. Um, his YouTube channel um, escapes me at the moment. Uh, Quits up, that's the one. Um, I, but I think even on KDE, which I think KDE has it on the right by default, he, he switches it over to, to the left. That is uh, just his preference. It seems to be that one of the first things he does when he's in, he's reviewing a distro that has it on the right is he moves it over to the left. Um, I suppose it's to, each to everyone's preference, but uh, from absolutely years of, of uh, using Windows, I'm just so used to it being up on the top right. I mean, uh, when I'm talking about years, I'm talking about like uh, well over uh, decades um, from using it from way back in Windows 3.1 all, all the way up to Windows 7 and Windows 8 and now Windows 10 and work. So I'm just so used to that usage paradigm that that's where my eyes automatically go when I want to Inter- interact with with the the window close minimize or maximize or whatever i think that's that's important as well though isn't it because you know what you're used to defines how efficient you are in your workflow and any changes have to really really help with your efficiency eventually to make it worthwhile investing in in the change otherwise it's just an annoyance you know yeah, for that exact same reason, um, any time that I have used a Mac, using Mac OS, I just get frustrated because of those little things. Um, and then when, for to me, uh, as I'm sure people, a lot of people will argue, but to me, as soon as any any time that I stuck down, sat down in front of a a Ubuntu computer when it was running Unity, I'm like, this is just exactly like a Mac to me. I'm like, the exact same frustrations was raising my anxiety. It was like, yeah. So, uh, so that's the reason why I kind of went, okay, if I was to use this, I would, I would have to customize it to how I like things. 
it's the way it's set up by default just annoys me and that's probably why he kind of gravitated towards like uh, Zubuntu or Kubuntu uh, rather than using Unity and it's similar enough when, now that um, Ubuntu is using GNOME by default. On, you mentioned Mac OS there. Um, there's one thing I really love about Mac because I use it. A, I use a Mac in work. Um, there's one thing I love about Mac that I would love to see in Linux. Now it probably is possible, but uh, you know, to make it as as simple and as fluid as it is on a Mac, is uh, like the touchpad gestures. So I think that they're so useful when you get used to them, and they're very, very like it's almost muscle memory it becomes after a little while so i kind of have to take my hat off to mac for that aspect of things like they do create workflows like the the, the, the machine is built around creating a workflow that works for you mm -hmm. and it, it is uh like it can become very satisfying and very fluid after a while when you really when you really get that groove i think uh, the way to achieve this you would need to have uh First, you have to have the hardware for it. So the Apple controls the hardware on the Mac, so they know that all the Macs that they, re they release are going to have a touchpad that has got free finger, five finger support. Yeah. Uh, you'd, need, uh, you'd need that on Linux as well. And I'm not sure if, I don't actually know if it's prevalent, if you can have that on every modern laptop. And then you'd obviously have to have a driver for that. And then somebody would have to build this into the, like build it into the environment. But I think, uh, if it's possible, and if you have the hardware, it might be able to set up in like GNOME or KDE. You can just do three fingers to the left or right to swipe between, uh, to swipe between the desktops and uh, maybe up and down to get your application, uh, applications and Windows stuff like that. I that's something that I would really like to see as well because uh, if I uh, like on uh, on uh, on laptops, this kind of fluidity, yeah, the the kind of workflow because when uh just to go back to the previous point i have the same thing that connor has with uh, mac and unity i have the same thing with like windows and cinnamon i come to it and my head just stops working because <laughs> uh it's all very so the the mac and uh the unity that's very much uh uh very much driven by keyboard and maybe those gestures on the on the on the touchpad whereas uh windows is very much made for the mouse so you just and i this 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 kind of paradigm where you just have to they they improved it now you can actually hit the start button and and uh, search and i think everything will come up i'm not sure but the 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 primary paradigm is clicking by the mouse and it's just not not something that uh, th that's not how i like to interact with the computer uh, just fanning the the troll fr uh, flames uh, I'm sure you'd be easily able to enable the gestures with elementary OS. I mean, that's just pretty much Mac anyway. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think so. I, haven't, I don't think I have the hard, hardware for it, though. Uh, maybe this this little computer has got like three or multiple, multiple dash support. Uh, so we mentioned launchers. So we, men sorry, we mentioned the workflow in Mac versus window and, uh, Windows and uh, Gnome like uh, Gnome, uh, let's say Gnome Classic or Gnome 2.0, where uh, it had uh, application places and uh, and settings on the top, which is still preserved by, I think, by default by Ubuntu Mate and, uh, or the whole Mate desktop. And and uh, we mentioned Unity, which, is, uh, which has got the full screen application launcher and gnome has got the same and then there's the kind of cinnamon or default called the kde launcher approach where you uh, hit the start or the menu button and you have got not quite full screen uh, categorical menu so so to recap recaps you have got the split one the categorical one and the full screen one which guys which ones do you prefer guys uh, but uh, just a point of clarification, because I'm sure somebody's going to write in angrily. Um, Any time we refer to the Windows key, it will be the super key or the meta key. Sometimes is a different name for anything like that. But um, I have found that I the reason one of the reasons why I like Cinnamon and I don't mind um, KD for that reason uh, reason either is 
again, I'm used to the Windows usage paradigm of the panel at the bottom. There's a, a menu down at the bottom left. You hit the that super key and then a menu pops up and you begin typing. Um, and also, that's the, I'm used to the mouse navigation, so that's the way my brain works. One thing I have been using more and more of late is uh, something called U Launcher, which I think by default, by default the keyboard command is uh, Shift and Space. And once you hit Shift and Space, then a simple uh, search bar comes up and you're able to launch a program. So it's Shift Space, start typing, and then usually, and it's, it's, um, it's, uh, fuzzy search is really good usually you only have to type in one or two letters and it comes up with the command that you want uh, for anyone who's interested because I actually dis discovered this when I was dual booting and I was like hmm, I wonder can I replicate this in Windows there's something called WOX uh, Wox Launcher or something that is very similar to uh, to U Launcher if you're used to U Launcher but um, of late I am I've started to use U-Launcher, and I actually quite like it. Yeah, I can vouch for U-Launcher as well. It's very good. Um, it looks very nice as well, and uh, yeah, I map it to super, super in space at the same time, so that kind of mimics the spotlight search on Mac. I'm very much a super key type, bang. That's how I work. So... Uh... Do you do you guys because I I kind of appreciate the full screen menu that is presented to me so I hit the super key and I get all the windows or all the applications I start typing and I get full screen search and I don't have to go through categories of menus or find the applications uh, through uh, through like lists of uh, and where I would have to remember where it actually is. Do you guys use these kind of menus or do you not anymore? I don't. Yeah, I don't really like that. And uh, those those kind of menus, I will use them if I have to, but I don't. It's not my preference. I believe pretty much uh, most of the uh, desktop environments are going towards the uh, where there's a, a menu and a search bar pops up or a full screen search. Um, off the top of my head, I think Mate by default doesn't and it does have the old school kind of tree menus but you can get a Mate menu that is very uh, very Windows like if you like that uh, XFC off the top of my head I don't think it does it by default either but the, the Whisker mm. menu is a great menu and is uh, installed by default on Zubuntu but stock uh, XFC if you just um, are on something and you say install XFC desktop I don't think it does it by default uh, LXQT I think is still a, a, a tree menu and I don't think it has a search menu option I don't know if it, one can be installed um, through the repositories or whatever but I uh, don't think it, it has one uh, these are just off the top of my head and of course uh, with KDE, you can pretty much emulate all of these. Uh, K Runner is a simple um, search where you just hit a button, start typing, it works. And I believe there's a a, a full screen uh, menu that you can implement in KDE as well. Yeah, I get frustrated now if I hit the super key and nothing happens, you know, because you just expect it to be that way, you know? Yeah, exactly, yeah. So <laughs> away from launchers and up to the uh, up to the whole kind of experience. Do you guys prefer bright or dark uh, uh, window? Well, what do you call it? dark or bright teams? Second, yeah, teams, yeah, dark. Yeah, Connor loves dark. We all know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I find them always a bit disturbing they never work properly there's always something missing and uh, not all applications are able to work with them uh, it's always a bit of a setup when it comes to things like firefox uh, mm. well at least it has been in I the past with firefox, yeah. it's, and, it's janky. and uh, it's just you know I I tried it I tried setting everything to dark but then I I actually visually much prefer kind of not completely bright uh, shiny white but something a bit a uh, bit more a uh, bit light 
a bit mellow, like, you know, the solarized light themes for Vim and stuff like that. That's where I find my uh, my sweet point. Uh, there's an ARC team, I think, ARC, uh, that used, I don't know if it's still, but it was a Solus's team by default for a long time. And it is a kind of a medium between the two. It's not fully dark, it's, it's not fully bright. It's kind of that solar, solarized um, elements to it. So it might be worth checking out. And Kubuntu 1804, I thought, did a really nice job on uh, a mix of dark and light themes. It's well worth checking Th- out as well. That's very true. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Michael from uh, Destination Linux fame has, was a consultant in relation to that. He keeps saying that uh, people, uh, he, asked, he was asked by the Kubuntu team, like, uh, oh, uh, uh, what like what what same defaults should we do and kind of he was asked for his feedback i wouldn't say he was the the, the last word on it but i was i think he was he was consulted but i could be wrong nice yeah that's uh, i think he did a really nice work on that one uh and last point that we have there uh desktop icons do you guys so uh, like your desktop to have any icons on there or do you just keep it uh without anything just just the picture and that's it I tend to keep minimum amount of icons uh, frequently used. Uh, I might have a Steam icon or I might have my home folder or maybe one or two things, maybe trash or something like that. Uh, but I usually keep try to keep it to only a handful, like four or five uh, at most. And then I like to see my desktop background. Yeah, I like uh, I like to have stuff on my desktop and I like it to be intentionally messy because there's a reason for that because whatever I'm working on at that moment in time, be it the podcast or maybe uh, uploading an episode to YouTube so I have to render the video and all that shit. Um, The only way I'll remember stuff is if I just leave it on the desktop as is in no folder organization, nothing, just the messier the better because then I'll notice it and I'll want to do something about it. Um, So I find it very, I I almost use my desktop like a visual to-do list. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty much like that. It's a it's a workshop top workshop worktop uh, that I that that I use it as. So uh, I can live. I could probably live without it, but then I would just have a, have another folder where I would have to uh, store all the things that are being worked on at the moment. I'd be icons too. Yeah, so uh, that's uh, four out of four for icons. Then, <laughs> uh, uh, all right. Well. We've been rambling on for a long time now, uh, so it's probably time for us to go and do something else. And uh, before we go, uh, we would like to do some plugging. So, uh, Mark, uh, first off, where can people find you and what would you like to plug? Well, I suppose um, you can find us at the binarytimes.net. Um, we do a podcast every fortnight and... Uh, Thanks for having me on, like guys. Ourselves. It's been, you know, what, what was that? I said like ourselves. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do Do you have a date when it comes out? Is it like every every other Monday or something like that? Every well, okay. We record every Saturday, every second Saturday morning, and then depending on how long it takes me to do the show notes and everything, kind of determines when <laughs> it actually comes out. So, have you been recording today? Or? Yes, we we were recording this morning. Uh, so listeners tune in after obviously listen to us because <laughs> not before but after you've listened to us you tune in for the binary time podcast at binarytimes.net uh on uh uh or at some point early next week i'd imagine uh, and not to guilt trip or anything but presumably we got a mention as well <laughs> you didn't actually <laughs> <laughs> oh <laughs> Uh, I didn't mention at all that I was going to be on the next slides. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Well, let let me mention us now then. So, if you want to find us, we are on Telegram, which uh, which uh, basically all these links are going to be in the show notes anyway. So, we are on Telegram, we are on Twitter, we are on that horrible thing called Facebook, uh, and on Mastodon to make up for that. You can email us at show at uh, linuxlets.com and uh, we do exist in real life so if you are in the dublin area you can uh, come and see us in the dublin 
uh, Dublin Linux Let's uh, sorry no Dublin Linux Community uh, two weekly meetup. Somebody correct me if I'm using the wrong frequency there. Fortnightly, yes. Yeah, it's every two weeks, basically on a Saturday. Either we go to the to a pub, or we go to a cafe, or we go to like a special uh, room that we hire, and it's always good fun, good chat about live Linux and everything. We obviously have all the answers. Uh, also, if you like what you're hearing and uh, you enjoy the Linux pod- Linux Lights podcast, you can buy us a beer or a shot uh, or a yacht or whatever you want us by using the <laughs> button. Yeah, a, a three Ferraris would be nice. Also a studio. If we, if you like, if you are, if you if you are into buying us studios, then uh, one in Central Dublin, somewhere near to my flat, would be great. Uh, so yeah, basically, if you want to send us some love, you can do so by PayPal. Uh, the link is on our website, is linuxlads.com slash support and uh, or linuxlets.com slash donate or linuxlets.com slash beer as well uh, again links are going to be on in the show notes so i'd just like to I... say as well this I'm, I'm determined to get to a meetup at some stage you know sooner rather than later and i will mention you on the binary times uh, except it'll be next episode because then i'll be discussing what i did you know in the past two weeks <laughs> so just to save myself there. <laughs> so we won't be sure which will turn up, um, come up first. Will be Mark turning up to our next meetup, uh, the next <laughs> Debian release, or the next FCE release? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, okay, so uh, that was us. That was the Linux Lights. I've been Mike. I've been Connor. I've been Shane. And I've been Mark. See you, fuckers. (laughs) Bye, guys. (laughs) Bye, though.